So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome for this policy roundtable. Welcome to our speakers. Welcome to our attendants online in Brussels and wherever you are. My name is Etienne Basso. I'm the director of the Members Research Service at TPRS and also acting director general. Welcome to all of you. This is our last policy roundtable before the summer break. And while the attention has been focusing on Russia and the war Russia launched against Ukraine, we also need to look at the wider world, and that's why we will dedicate this event to China. We would like to look at China's economy, the long-term trends and the vulnerabilities, investments that are not sustainable, inequalities, effects uh, of climate change, to name only a few challenges. We will discuss also the reform agenda, reforms, which experts considered needed, have not been implemented for years and their further postponement is a real possibility. On these issues, uh, Jakob Kierkegaard uh, wrote a piece of research for the Parliament. It is shared uh, in the chat and I encourage you to read it and make reference to it. <clears throat> the panel will also share insights regarding the domestic and inter international political implications of China's economies, economic course. It will particularly focus on the consequences for the EU and possible EU reactions. Uh, you might remember that we issued a couple of weeks ago in the EPRS this, uh, this study, which is about future shocks. And I mention it because the slowdown of Chinese economy was precisely one of the shocks that could affect uh, also the EU. So uh, important uh, to look at it. Let us start our discussion, uh, and I would like to start with welcoming Reinhard Bittikofer, who has been member of the Parliament uh, since 2009 for the Greens. He is a member of the Committee of Foreign Affairs and a substitute in um, INTA. Uh, in Foreign Affairs, he's also served as a spokesperson for his party, but he's also, and that's extremely relevant, of course, for this event today, is a chair of our inter-parliamentary delegation for the relations with China. Besides his position in his party and the parliament, he has been an active member of various think tanks. So we are very much uh, looking forward to your presentation, Reinhard. Over to you. Thank you. Mr. Basso, for putting this on and for including me in the event. I'm very excited to learn from Jacob's presentation and from the discussion of our economist panel. And I will not compete with them when I make a few introductory remarks. Let me start by stating that I believe that the relationship between the economic and the political realms in China is fundamentally different from what we know in Europe or in the United States. This is one of the reasons I believe why this assumed automaticity of a convergence on the basis of enhanced economic relationships between the West and China failed so miserably. In my thinking, I reference uh, Karl August Wittvogel, who was originally a German sociologist and sinologist in the last century. He, he died an American citizen in 1988. And in his important work about the economy and society in China, published in 1931, he developed his thesis about China as a hydraulic society. With this term, he describes a society that could not sustain societal reproduction without intervention of a political force because of the need to master huge hydraulic projects. So in a way, he describes China as a society in which politics is a productive force way beyond anything that we usually uh, um, observe in, in our societies. Uh, 
that's why I believe that uh, when we look at the relationship of the uh, political sphere and the economic sphere in China, we shouldn't just look at the inherited organizational principles of Leninism. We should also um, pay attention to the China specific legalist tradition, the Fatia tradition, which reflects uh, the uh, specific uh, understanding of the role of politics uh, in that society. If we move closer to the present, I would like to quote Jörg Wutke, the president of the European Chamber of Commerce in China, who has argued in many of his reports that growth would benefit hugely if China would be willing to enact market-oriented reforms. However, that is not the case, at least not with the scope that uh, Jörg uh, would envision. And I believe this is uh, due to um, Xi Jinping's policy that the party leads everything, which means that there is less scope under this regime of Xi Jinping. And there he is different, I would say, from his immediate predecessors, at least gradually different, which gives absolute priority to party politics and the stabilization of party control over everything. In one way, we could argue that by choosing that road, he is undermining the dynamic that made China successful over the 40 years of reform and opening up. Deng Xiaoping's of ref, uh, policy of reform and opening up was also uh, strongly focused on reducing uh, the uh, role of the party, on cutting back of party interference in economic decisions and uh, societal um, proceedings. But that has been reversed by Xi Jinping. I'm still not sure that we can conclude from that analysis that his policy is going to fail. I think he is making a very bold um, bet on the ability of the Communist Party leadership in China to manage a top-down balance between creativity and imposed order on the basis of a very strong um, communication technology uh, and um, uh, totalitarian use of that technology. And one argument that he might not be um, destined to fail completely can be um, uh, can be uh, found in, in a historic comparison. For many, many centuries, China was a um, place of wealth, place of progress, place of innovation without ever having been the home of the free. So maybe there, there could be a way of shaping um, economic progress without subscribing to the principles of freedom and democracy. Maybe and I think that's what the what Xi Jinping sets out to, to do this again, to make China a strong, economically thriving country by allowing creativity in sectors that he circumscribes, that the party circumscribes, but cutting down on a competition, cutting down on free movement of ideas and all that. And I think that this poses indeed a very fundamental challenge to our order, to our perspectives. And I think instead of just looking for signals that this policy is going to fail, we should very earnestly also look for signals that they might have some success because we would have to cope with that 
and that would even be more dangerous than if they failed. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, scene setting uh, remarks. Let's uh, move now uh, to uh, Jakub. Uh, Jakub, you wrote uh, this piece of research I was mentioning before. You are, uh, for those who don't know you, a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund, GMF in Brussels, a non resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C., where you have been working for many years. Uh, you are also a senior advisor to the Rodion Group, a private research firm. Com uh, research firm specializing in Chinese economy, climate change, and international investment flows. You previously served uh, with the Danish Ministry of Defense under the UN in Iraq, uh, and you work uh, as well uh, for financial services. Uh, you are the author of several books, and you teach in Europe and the US. So we are very much uh, looking forward to hear you uh, and to hear you, uh, the presentation of the study that you recently uh, published uh, on behalf of EPRS. Over to you, Jakob. Welcome. Thank you very much, Etienne, and thank you very much, Reinhardt, for those uh, framing remarks. I'm just going to share my screen very quickly here, and then um, we can get going. Um, and I think it's important to say from the beginning uh, what this presentation uh, is not. Uh, uh, and it's obviously framed on, on identifying what I consider to be very dramatic uh, long term implications uh, for the Chinese growth trajectory. But uh, at the same time, I think, you know, it's important from the beginning to say that this is not a, you know, an argument that says that China is going to face some sort of imminent collapse or anything like that. It is rather uh, an argument that says that uh, structural factors, particularly the increasingly dire uh, demographic outlook of China, basically uh, means that China is facing uh, a very dramatic growth slowdown, if not outright stagnation. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, we should factor that in as we look at China as an economic and political player in the global economic economy uh, going forward. And we should certainly not uh, simply straight line the trajectory of China's economic growth rates over the last uh, 30 to 40 years, because that uh, is not going uh, to continue or at least can only continue through increasing outright falsification of uh, Chinese growth uh, data. Um, I thought, though, I would start uh, uh, this presentation by just highlighting uh, some new demographic data that actually was published this week by the UN, uh, uh, that basically the world uh, population prospects for 2022. Uh, because what this, uh, pa this these are not uh, in the paper, I should say, but they include the implications of uh, China's most recent uh, demographic data, uh, because what we're basically seeing here uh, is in these two charges that China faces an unprecedented demographic transition. Uh, it is likely uh, to uh, see an outright decline in the population in 2022. And what you can see here on the figure uh, to the left is essentially that uh, the end of China's one child policy, which happened in 2016, has not had any effect uh, in restoring uh, China's fertility rates. In fact, the opposite. Since that policy was lifted, uh, fertility has dropped nearly 30, uh, 40 percent uh, in China. And uh, then if you look at the chart on the right, which is basically the latest UN population figures that incorporates uh, the recent developments in China, you can see that while we're certainly right to worry about the demographic outlook here in Europe, uh, it's important to recognize that the outlook in China is far, far worse than what we're facing here in Europe. Uh, and obviously, at the same time, the United States uh, is, in a, is in a different and much more benign situation. So while we rightfully worry about the demographic outlook in Europe, we have to ask ourselves, in my opinion, well, why do we assume that China uh, can just sail through its own much worse demographic transition? And basically what I'm going to argue with you here is that obviously China cannot. 
uh, do so, and that this transition has very dramatic long-term implications uh, for China that we need to factor in. Now, some of you might say, well, this is long-term projections. Uh, demographics can change, uh, which is true. But I would caution you that uh, demographic uh, re fertility rebounds among uh, medium and high income countries such as China today are very rare. In fact, uh, the table that I put here, which is from the, uh, from the paper, highlights that uh, it only, in fact, among this category of countries has taken place in some of the Eastern European countries uh, as they came out of the economic crisis after the end of the Cold War, and many of them look forward to democracy, market economy, and EU membership. Uh, there are to date no examples of a material rebound in fertility rates in an East Asian country. Uh, what that ultimately means is that the numbers that I showed you from the UN in the previous slide may very well be biased upwards because they assume a fertility rebound uh, for China that, as I said, has not actually taken place uh, in Asia, in any Asian country today. Uh, so uh, this is therefore, I think, dangerous to simply dismiss uh, these issues as something that will change over time and it's long term, etc. The reality is that China would need to engineer an unprecedented fertility rebound uh, for an Asian country to actually avoid the demographic fate that I showed you uh, before. Now, at the same time, of course, demographics is not destiny. And as we know very well in Europe, there are things that countries can and should do to avoid the worst outcomes of this, um, as has been going on in many European countries for many years. But what I would argue here is that actually China is failing to take these uh, uh, precautions when it comes to adapting society to a rapidly aging population. We know very well from many European countries the problem of pension systems in, in this scenario. Um, you basically need to either you know, decrease benefits, increase contributions, or more importantly, perhaps raise the retirement age. The reality is that China is doing no such thing. China has, in fact, today, one of the lowest retirement ages uh, in uh, among middle and, and high income countries between 50 and 60 years old, a rate that has been unchanged since the 1950s, when average uh, life expectancy in China was in the mid 40s. Reality today is that life expectancy in China is 77. So obviously, uh, this is a situation that uh, cannot be sustainable. And what I think is perhaps even more worrying is that this is well acknowledged by the Chinese leadership. Premier Li Keqiang has several times in previous years announced uh, significant changes to the pension system, increases in retirement ages, et cetera. But these reforms have always been withdrawn and never implemented, highlighting the fact that far from having a sort of complete control of the policy agenda uh, in China, the Chinese government is subject to many of the same societal pressures that uh, European countries are faced with. You know, raising retirement ages in China to date has been proven politically impossible. Uh, therefore, we should not believe that China is sort of governed by this far-sighted uh, uh, group of economic um, strategic minds that basically prepare the world uh, for China's eventual rise. That is not the case. Uh, more broadly, uh, you know, in aging societies, uh, what you should expect, especially in places like China, uh, where you have an incomplete social safety net, is you will have higher proportionary savings among households. Uh, that leads to lower levels of household consumption and ultimately, which is precisely the situation in China today, over-reliance on investment-led growth and increasingly even, in the case of China, at least during the COVID era, uh, also rising trade surpluses. So what you see in this chart here, which is slightly complicated, but the bottom line here is basically that China today continues to have an unprecedented level of investment-led growth, uh, infrastructure, housing, et cetera, far beyond even other Asian countries, 
Uh, and the only time that countries came close to the level, which is the red bar, uh, the red line sustained by China over the last 10 years, are basically the bubbled economies in Asia immediately before the uh, Asian financial crisis in 1997. Now, doesn't mean that China is a different type of country, uh, but the bottom line is that this is a growth model that is not, in my opinion, going to remain sustainable. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk too much about the Chinese real estate market, but this is clearly uh, the dominant sector in Chinese growth uh, over the last at least 10 to 15 years. It is also, with declining population, a sector that faces structural uh, that your lower demand uh, and therefore cannot continue to uh, play the outsized role in China's economic growth that it has to date. There are also a host of short-term liquidity leverage issues in this sector, but bottom line, real estate in China, investment in real estate construction cannot continue to be the kind of uh, engine for Chinese domestic demand that it has been uh, in recent years. And it is also very clear that the kind of, of zero COVID patchy or not that Xi Jinping is implementing is aggravating many of these factors. Because obviously when Chinese consumers at any moment in time can be face significant or draconian lockdowns, what are they going to do? They're obviously going to increase their precautionary savings, uh, leading to further uh, imbalances and, and difficulty in uh, stimulating private consumption uh, in China. Um, more broadly, uh, China is, of course, a country that uh, faces continued high levels of income inequality, both at the regional and the individual level. Uh, but it's important to recognize that China is actually, you know, sort of borrow a European term, the fiscal union in China between the provincial government and the central government in China is either incomplete or certainly unreformed. Uh, uh, in China. And what you can see here on the chart to the left is essentially the fiscal dominance or, or, or of the central government, that the uh, most of the fiscal revenue in China comes from uh, comes to the central government, uh, whereas provincial governments that have many most of the demands uh, put on it in terms of services provision, etc., basically are suffering from acute fiscal uh, you know, deficits and therefore have to raise revenue through all sorts of other means, either selling land or raising debt, uh, et cetera. Um, this means also because, as you can see here on the, on the figure to the right, that China actually has a very limited, uh, you know, a general government tax intake and the kind of taxes that China levers is actually highly regressive. Uh, China has probably the least redistributive, uh, least progressive taxation system uh, among all of the countries that are covered by the OECD, uh, which means that China's fiscal framework is, you know, almost uniquely poorly equipped to address either domestic income inequality on the regional and, and individual level, but perhaps more importantly, is also very poorly equipped to stimulate basic consumption demand, uh, uh, which is what is causing uh, a lot of the issues uh, that we're seeing or aggravating the one of the issues that we're seeing at the moment. So in the interest of time, let me just reiterate, look, China is not, in my opinion, heading for an imminent financial crisis or, or big global. The fact that you have state-owned banks, a closed current account, and an authoritarian government means stability uh, uh, will almost certainly be preserved. At the same time, China is, in my opinion, inadvertently heading for a dramatic growth slowdown. And I certainly cannot see scenarios where credibly the potential growth rate in China is more than 2%. The reason for that is very simple. China faces a declining population and, uh, you know, has low productivity growth, which is basically the two sources of potential growth. The last decade, China's productivity growth was 0.7% on average. Uh, even if you triple that uh, going forward, uh, you would get to only about 2% given the population uh, uh, dynamics. I think that's highly unlikely, but in reality, as I said, the bottom line is that growth slowdown dramatically in China is, in my opinion, inevitable. This is very difficult for the Chinese government to acknowledge. Uh, rising China is obviously the centerpiece of Xi Jinping's legitimacy. 
Uh, China doesn't rise very much if its potential growth rate is only the level of the EU and lower than that of the United States. Unfortunately, this is very difficult for the IMF, the World Bank, and other international institutions to acknowledge because China is on the board of these uh, organizations. It is also increasingly difficult for private sector observers to actually acknowledge because if private investment banks and others were to publish a lot of research saying this, they would probably be kicked out of the Chinese markets. In other words, face disciplining that way. We should also acknowledge, in my opinion, that especially in Washington, uh, but also here in the Brussels, there are powerful constituents that benefit from the narrative of a rising China. If you believe, where do you think Pentagon uh, budget increases are going to come from? They're not going to come from Ukraine war. They're going to come from the rivalry with China. Well, that looks a lot different if we shouldn't assume that China grows faster than the U.S. going forward. Obviously, uh, you know, if you want more integration of the EU to challenge China, uh, uh, you know, at the same logic, it applies here that, uh, you know, benefit people here in Brussels, institutions here in Brussels benefit from that kind of narrative. Um, but I think it's particularly important to recognize the prospects of declining Chinese growth because it has very dramatic implications in the long run for global commodity demands, et cetera, in a period like this, where obviously we're facing short-term acute inflationary concerns. But basically what this tells you is they will not last. Uh, in my opinion. And then finally, I should say the paper also goes into uh, some detail, namely that probably, and this is the really good news that I want to end with, is that probably the best prospect for China to escape the kind of low productivity, if you like, middle income trap that I think the country is facing is to execute a successful decarbonization of the economy which it is well on the way to do, in my opinion. And obviously the government, the top-down level of the government uh, means that it is able to mobilize investment in renewable energies at a level right now, certainly not uh, followed either in the US or uh, the United States. But uh, let, me, let me finish there and uh, I look forward to a, uh, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jakob, for explaining so clearly the challenges and presenting your your, your study in that way. Uh, I was uh, looking at the body language of the panelists, and I see that many of them will certainly react uh, to what uh, you were saying. And that brings me to the next part of our event, uh, is the presentations by, by the panelists. And uh, I hand over to Elena Lazaro, who is uh, the acting head of our external policies unit. She will moderate. Uh, that discussion. Over to you, Elena. Thank you very much, Etienne. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, very nice to see the speakers, some of whom I also consider colleagues and friends, and the others very new friends and colleagues. Uh, so uh, welcome to this event and welcome, uh, uh, Mr. Butikofer. Um, China is perhaps one of the biggest areas in which EPRS has focused in recent years, and I think globally that's a phenomenon. So I think it's very appropriate to have this event now, as we close uh, as we close this uh, this academic year. And uh, following Jakob's presentation, we have with us today. Uh, three excellent, uh, experienced China experts who will, in a minute, uh, give us their sense of the reaction to to the paper, the reaction to the presentation, which I would like to say has taken things a bit forward because the paper was written, in fact, in May 2020. So a lot has happened since then. Uh, COVID, Ukraine. So uh, the conversation will also assess those trends in light of these phenomena, um, and also uh, in. The conversation that we will uh, we are about to have will also look at um, not only uh, the reactions to Jakob's paper, the various topics that he has mentioned, such as the demographics, the need for reforms, um, investment led growth, and, and 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 how sustainable that is, fiscal issues, but also the the interplay between politics and economics uh, that uh, Mr. Butikofer also alluded to. But I will also invite the panelists in a minute to also comment on the implications uh, that that will have uh, for the EU and for the global economy, which I think we are all looking at right now post COVID, arguably post, but also in light of the Ukraine crisis with renewed interest and, 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 and fear, I would add, and perhaps new emerging uh, trends. 
Um, I should also say before I introduce the panelists that um, I think it's particularly important to remember the relevance of China uh, for the EU, since we are uh, based in the European, we are part of the European Parliament uh, as one of the two biggest uh, trade partners of the European Union. Um, as the third biggest economy in the world, as demographically the biggest uh, in the world uh, still, a uh, most important emitter of carbon dioxide, and I think this links up also to, to Jakub's last point, but also a very critical part of our supply chains and the supply chain resilience issues that have come up as a result of, of, of COVID and of Ukraine, uh, very often linking up to discussions with China. So I think all these issues may come up uh, in the discussion. Uh, I also would like to say, I've already put it in the chat, that participants are invited to pose their questions uh, in the chat uh, and in the Q&A function while the speakers are intervening. Uh, Mr. Butikover has kindly also offered to take a question, so all our speakers, including Keynote and the presenter of the paper, will be addressing your questions. So do put your thoughts in the chat or in the Q&A as, as speakers are speaking and we'll collect them. We have about uh, half an hour for the for the debate. Uh, so I'll introduce uh, our speakers in the order that, uh, that uh, they will um, intervene in. Uh, we first have Alicia Garcia Herrero. She is Chief Economist for Asia Pacific at Natixis, which is an investment uh, management firm. Uh, she also serves as Senior Fellow at the Brussels-based uh, think tank Bruegel, which I think everyone knows very well, and at the East Asia Institute um, of the National University in Singapore. Welcome. Uh, we're very glad to have you with us, Alicia. I should also point out that Alicia has made some very interesting observations about Chinese inflation today on Twitter, so I invite you to look at that. Uh, we'll then be, uh, Alicia will be followed by Yu Jie. Uh, she's a senior research fellow on China in the Asia Pacific program at Chatham House. Uh, she focuses more on the Chinese foreign policy, but also on the economic dimensions of Chinese foreign policy, so economic diplomacy. So we'll hear uh, from Yu Jie afterwards. And then we'll finish with Uli Jochheim, who is a policy analyst in the External Policies Unit of EPRS, so a colleague of mine, uh, where he works in our unit on uh, East Asia, South Asia, and Oceania. And I will also like to point attention to the fact that we've just released today uh, the first version, the first episode of our YouTube series, Chronicles, uh, where Ulrich speaks about China uh, demographics. Uh, so without further ado, I invite the first round of reactions to Jakob's presentation, uh, around seven minutes by each of our panelists. Alicia, you have the floor. Well, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Elena, for the for the introduction, and thank you everybody for organizing this uh, very interesting e event and giving me the opportunity to comment on Jacob's paper, uh, which can't be more timely. Uh, and by the way, even updated as I read it because it does mention um, something that I think is quite important: is that COVID, if anything, has only uh, made uh, that scenario, which I fully agree with, of uh, China's very low growth down the road, uh, more pressing and probably uh, faster than we would have imagined otherwise. And we could uh, go into why this is the case, but <clears throat> we can we can skip it now, and I'll focus on on the key points I wanted to make, and these are the following. <clears throat> While fully agreeing with uh, that baseline scenario that China, in a way, is a shrink in China, let's put it this way. I mean, China, in terms of its um, contribution to global growth, will clearly be less relevant. And uh, the question is, uh, as you said, Elena, what is it up for us in that scenario? Well, the first reaction would be, well, uh, maybe because China has had become so overwhelming in global value chains, uh, Maybe one could read it as slightly positive because, you know, uh, th th there might be other players. Uh, the problem with, with this is that as a result of COVID scarring, and this is clearly the case in a lot of the emerging world, uh, we might not have that uh, spare will uh, in time for us to, to feel that relief that, well, I mean, th this is uh, this humongous economy with a different political and even economic uh, model, as uh, Reinhardt mentioned, might not be as relevant. The question is, okay, if that's the case, we're in trouble unless we have other spare wheels. And, and I, I think 
for me, I, I, I think it's really urgent uh, for any European institution, any think tank in Europe or anywhere else to try to find out where are these spare wheels. And, and, and of course, many um, major economies come to mind. And I don't need to repeat which ones they are, because I know we are even negotiating with some of them uh, lately. And that's clearly the case of India. And, and, and for some, we've been trying for 20 years and we haven't reached a deal. So, you know, I think this calls for action. If, if that baseline scenario is correct, it calls for action from our side to, to basically chase those opportunities that, that maybe we've not really focused on, uh, given the uh, easy or, or low hanging fruits of China's growth model. That's the first. The second is what if, what if China is already relevant enough that even with a growth rate of 2%, and I've done my own calculations because I happen to have a, a structural growth rate for 2030 of 2.2, .2, so it's very, we're very close. Um, uh, even with 2.2 .2 growth rate, China will actually become a moderately developed economy. It, it will take longer than perhaps uh, many would have imagined, but it will be there. It will be a relevant um uh, market given its population size and and its uh, average income and you may say well um what else does china need to still be that massive um power economic power that we see today down the road even if it grows say at two percent the, the issue really is that china has a lot of um, uh, advantages accumulated advantages to be relevant enough globally, if not the most relevant economy globally, even with very low growth. And I think that's what we need to focus on. This is because of um, a number of characteristics that China has had for a long time. Uh, Jacob alluded to the fact that we still don't see a crisis. Yeah, I mean, I quite agree with that. Even if we read in Bloomberg, the mortgage crisis, that's the new one. <laughs> I mean, everybody talks about different types of crisis. They never come. And they never come because China's saving ratio is humongous. It's actually even going up again. Uh, bigger trade surplus, even if everybody thought that the trade surplus was something demo day. China is back with a huge trade surplus um, as a consequence of COVID um, and an, as a consequence of very, very stagnant imports. Let's, we could discuss why this is the case. I, I, I do think China is, is pushing a self-reliance policy on, on that front. But I, I'm going to wrap up a little bit. One reason uh, basically is that this humongous amount of savings are still there. So in a way, China is insulated. China is insulated to do many things, many of which clearly non-efficient, bringing low growth, but still relevant for the world. One is, of course, using the savings to buy up technology globally, and we've already seen that. What if China already um, manages, and there's a number of bottlenecks there, semiconductors and the like, but manages to basically control major technologies, say for climate change or transition to climate to uh, to green energy. China is very close to that. Bloomberg uh, just estimated uh, a few weeks ago that on the refining side of everything from cobalt, cobalt to manganese to nickel, mm, I'm missing one, but anyway, the four major uh, metals for uh, electric vehicles and more generally um, energy transition, China dominates and is expected to reach 90% of refinery by 2025. So there you go. Even if they, if China grows 2%, in a way, nothing changes. And, and I want to uh, highlight this point because that's the key point I want to make, that we should not focus on growth only. China might look stagnant, but remain very powerful as far as we're concerned. And I think that's the scenario we need to focus on this is true for not only in terms of technology, but also in terms of leverage. So you just mentioned China as the highest emitter, as, as the largest emitter. That might be, uh, in a way, a, for, I mean, a, a, a sign of force for China because it can actually leverage upon that. And, 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 and therefore, I think we need and global value chains, I mean, bottlenecks, et cetera. So I end by saying that uh, while I do agree with 
uh, Jacob's uh, results, we need to now uh, push a step further to understand how that changes the scenario uh, as far as we're concerned. And if it doesn't, because even a stagnant China can become very powerful in terms of changing the global order uh, and, and the like, and even the economic global order, then we are back to square one and we need to think through this scenario and see what we can do about it. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia. I think you've complemented uh, Jakob's presentation in, in, in a way uh, by, by bringing, by teasing out these sources of Chinese global leverage and that count as a counterbalance to, to slowing growth uh, in, by accentuating China will remain very powerful to other ways. And if I may make a link between two of your points is I think the narrative that is helping the Pentagon and others boost their spending because of China is also linked to the technology aspect that you've mentioned and, and to that supply chain aspect. So I think it all comes together, um, which makes it very a good transition point to move to to sort of China's economic diplomacy and to 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 how that fits into everything. And on this uh, and her reactions to the paper, I now turn to Jie. Uh, who is with us. So uh, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Elena. Also, let me firstly thank um, EPRS to have invited me to be here today and also share this in panel with the story panelist as well as Ulick at the same time. So really delighted to be here. Now, I very much agree with the baseline assessment for Jacob's paper and I actually read it thoroughly last night. I'm very, mm, he read my mind as well. So fully agree with his assessment. Now, maybe I can add in a few points in here and Firstly, this perhaps for the first time that Beijing realized itself caught in a perfect storm. On the one hand, well, want to um, introduce the so-called common prosperity initiative was on the other hand, given this a lockdown happened in Shanghai, this continuous and per persistent way of locking down. And then that's perhaps presenting first the economic challenge, but secondly, also a psychological challenge, um, both for the Chinese private entrepreneurs, private investors, as well as the foreign investors, you know, that psychology of while well, Chinese government having this constant lockdown and therefore what is the next, whether that the supply chains was in China will be stable, whether the port in China, they'll be able to open and resume its activities very normally. So that really the psychological impacts on the Shanghai lockdown is not doing any good for the Chinese economy. Now, second, what we have in here is compounded by China's very interesting choice on the war in Ukraine. And then obviously this will push up the food price and this will also push up the energy price for the domestic consumption inside China. But so far we seems didn't realize that the, uh, the, the ghost of inflation have not really determined the Chinese economy yet. But I think let's wait until quarter three and quarter four that while you see the high price of food and also the high price of energy, which impact on ordinary household, and then that perhaps will prompt the Chinese government to rethink twice regarding its zero COVID policy. So at the end of the day, what really keeps Xi Jinping and his colleagues wake up in the middle of the night, it is not on this competition with the United States, it is not on this relationship with Russia, but actually for the proper food price hike, um, like for example, on rice and on pork, on these kind of things, really could keep them wake up in the middle of the night because the last thing the Chinese Communist Party want to see is they want to see, they don't want to see a scenario like what happened on the eve of 1989. Yes, you do have many people on the street protect, protesting for the sake of democracy, but you also have millions of others protesting on the street, really for the uh, for the for the sake of the high inflation and also for the high food price. So that is a scenario that the Communist Party want to avoid up here. Now, second element in here I want to add it is on this um, demographic decline. So back to the common prosperity, back to this whole ideas of cracking down technology companies and tutoring education companies and also on the property sector. This is all actually back to the original route, which is all about mitigating the possible impacts of um, um, a demographic de decline. So the Chinese government is unable to reverse the trend. The only thing they'll be able to do it is how they're going to mitigate the impacts of demographic decline. So by encouraging having, allow young couples to have more children, therefore by reducing the property price and also reducing the price of afford a secondary education and so on and so forth. 
So these are the measures that's been introduced in this last summer, but it introduced so drastically without consulting the relevant stakeholders, without really consulting all the parties involved, and then caused quite a panic and shock in the stock market, but also on the Chinese economy in general. So that has not really felt very well. And therefore, at the end of the day, for where we are, this common prosperity has not been put on hold for the very moment. Because at the end of the day, what common, common prosperity is after? It is after the wealth distribution. It is really after the very anxious Chinese middle class, which already own property, which already have enough wealth, but somehow the government is going after them to looking for inheritance tax, looking for property tax contribution, and in order to redistribute the income distributions inside China for poor household. So these are the measures that has been introduced, and these are for the sake of common prosperity, but also to mitigating demographic decline trend. So this one thing. Now, another thing which I'd like to mention in here is that while we're talking about um, um, the Chinese economic model, and obviously the investment-led growth model has not really fared very well, given the current economic and political climate, but what can China really do? I mean, last year, it seems to be that much of the Chinese, uh, Chinese economic growth are still very much driven by export oriented revenues. It's less so driven by consumption. I think really if China wants to lead wholeheartedly a consumption driven economy, and what Beijing will have to do is Beijing will have to transfer those incomes from the local government, uh, those financial resources from the local government to every single individual household. So that would really take a very strong political will to do that. And the whether Xi Jinping himself have that political review uh, uh, views and also have the means and measures of doing that, we're not sure at the moment. And all we have on now is waiting for the 20th Party Congress, whether we will have a new set or new cohort of economic planner that much more willing to take the risk of deleveraging, much more willing to take the risk of um, redistribute the income distributions that happen inside China. So these are the things. Now, on the very last point um, on this reflection on war in Ukraine, I think uh, two lessons that China has learned, or at least the Chinese, Chinese economic planners has learned, uh, in case there might be a military escalation towards Taiwan. And I don't think China would necessarily be fair better than Russia these days, because Russia is the predominant export. It is based on raw materials, on primary materials that cannot be replaced. But however, for China's case, most of the export, it is down to manufacturing products that could be replaced within, let's say, two or three years' times. So that would put China in a very difficult situation. So that's lesson learned number one. Now, lesson learned number two is that while we're talking about dual circulation, while we're talking about domestic circulation, relying on domestic production and consumption to drive the economy, and ultimately, the more foreign direct investment happening inside China, the more foreign investors invested in China financially as well as economically, and then that will put in China in a more comfortable position not enduring some sense of sanction, like what, Ru what Russia has enjoyed in the past. So actually, to further open up its economy, it is perhaps for China's own economic survival, and less so just about dealing with a foreign investment in here. So I end in here and much look forward to hearing your comments and questions. Thank you very much. That's most interesting. And, and, and you focused on the, the zero COVID policy, uh, delved into the Ukraine Russia issue but you also brought up a topic that I then I would I was planning to ask all the speakers to come into perhaps in the second round or in your responses which is you know after the the party congress uh, this fall do you expect what what you have mentioned um the new more risk taking approach by whoever the new economic planners are or not, because there seems to be a sense of a reform stagnation at the at the moment in light of the upcoming political constellations and developments. But do we what do we expect in 2023? Uh, so I would ask all speakers to keep that in mind if they want to react with along with other questions that are already coming in. And again, I encourage audience the audience to keep writing and sending questions. Uh, and I will then now move to Ulrich Jochheim, our in-house expert, for his comments. And also on that last point, also mentioned that Uli has indeed written about Russia-China relations, so maybe he'll come in on that too. So Ulrich, to you. Thank you very much, Elena. 
and uh, as I was expecting, being the third speaker has the impact that many of the issues you wanted to mention have already been uh, mentioned. So I will a little bit jump from certain issues to other ones. And I'd like to start with a very personal observation. I used to work on China as an economic desk officer from 2007 and 2011. And at the time, the Chinese uh, government was extremely competent. And when there was a problem, they identified and mostly solved it. And I was really surprised when last year I restarted working on China and the opposite is true. So I'm much less optimistic in a certain way on China than I was still one year ago. And I'll come to that point later. I would not even necessarily exclude a crisis. But um, I mean, foreign affairs took that point really down very well. It put from 1978 to 2012, structural impediments were more often than not remedied unlashing growth and development in the past 35 years. But such problems are not being tackled today. So to that one, I would unfortunately fully subscribe. Then my second point is more of political nature. Um, I think a very simplistic idea is that you have an autocrat in Zhongnanhai. You might, some people even call him a dictator and he could push on the button. And the somehow even more surprising thing is that uh, one of those competent technocrats up to 2011 are also close advisors to President He, like Liu He, who was already very important uh, before and is probably now the singer's most important advisor on economic issues. So you have a kind of si similar set with a different, let's say, leader and the results are much less evident than they used to be before. I will come back on that later. Then uh, Jakob already, I think, made a very valuable point in slightly re-emphasizing certain issues in his paper, because I think between uh, the end of his drafting and the current point, there have been some interesting developments, actually reinforcing, as he also implied, what he had described. This is, for example, true in the real estate sector. Alicia clearly rightly mentioned also COVID, but also with the same impact, reinforcing the arguments. But just to show how badly the situation was in April and May, I will only quote one figure. Property sales in August were down by 39% year on year, knowing how important the real estate sector is for the overall economic performance. And uh, the government reacted as it mostly does by uh, allowing local governments to issue bonds earlier. And the amounts we're talking about are really important. We're talking about 200, 300 billion US dollars. And the impact of all this is going to be that uh, the, the total debt level of China will rise. And there's one of the most interesting graphs I hadn't seen before in Jakob's paper on page 14 about the total public and private debt. And he shows how extremely highly leveraged China is already today. So the overall debt level is actually pretty shocking. So they add that on an already high level. So actually, uh, this doesn't look too good in the long term. Uh, and clearly, normally, the unfavorable demographic situation will reinforce those problems. And Jakob was also mentioning the recent UN data on demographic developments, but I will a little bit elaborate because I find them extremely interesting, even if demographics is not everything. Um, our colleague Claire promised, the CC promised to put the link, there it is. And the nice thing with that web page is there is an util, a tool, and you can click, choose your country and see six criteria out of that report. And the figures on China are really shocking, just to mention them, I think, to, to illustrate the point. The EU yen, uh, United Nations project that China's population will decrease from more or less 1.4 billion currently to 800 million in the year 2100. And they also forecast that by 2080, uh, people in the age cohort above 65 will outnumber those in the age cohort 25 to 64, which we normally define as working age population. And the trend will only get worse after 2080, up to 2100. And uh, I'm even more skeptical than Jakob in a certain sense, knowing Northeast Asia pretty well. Unless you accept high immigration, I cannot see how that situation could change so much. Because, and there is a, let's say, a cultural inhibition in these countries against immigration, or at least against the immigration that would be necessary to clearly improve the outlook. So, 
there I'm so very skeptical from that point of view, perhaps even more skeptical than Jakob. And uh, on the impact of uh, likely, very likely, medium term growth slowdown in China, let's not forget that many countries close to China, like Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and even Australia, are highly dependent on exports to China. In some cases, I think now we are, I think Taiwan has 35% of its exports going to China. So if there were a growth slowdown, as we expect, it will have a huge impact on the whole growth performance of Northeast Asia in total. So I think this should not be forgotten that kind of second and third round effects from that growth slowdown uh, coming from the region as such. On the political issue, actually, Udye made already a point I wanted to make on food inflation and the revolt of 1989, because my general point would be to say that many things we see still today are due to the analysis of the party of what happened in 1989. So one of the uh, reasons they came up with was that there was a corruption and lack of ideological conviction in the Soviet Union explaining, for example, why there is this strong anti-corruption campaign by Xi Jinping. The second point, as uh, Udia was already saying, is inflation, uh, and, and the, especially uh, food inflation, knowing that food is a very important issue inside Chinese culture, fresh, you know, fresh vegetables, there is no country which, no culture which attaches such a huge importance to the freshness of vegetables. And actually, inflation was also a major reason why the Guomindang was defeated in the second half of the 40s. So the Chinese government is a little bit like, to be frank, to be very direct, like the German government obsessed by inflation. So this is a very important aspect, I think, uh, regarding uh, the war in Ukraine and the impact it is likely to have, as mentioned by Udia, on food inflation. And I think the third consequence of uh, the CCP's analysis of 1989 is that they have strongly privileged urban elites ever since. And this might, in my opinion, explain partially what Jakob was saying about the tax system. It's actually regressive, but being regressive means that it doesn't tax the urban elites, which are most of the middle class, as it should be in order to allow uh, broader consumption by lower income people and by people in the countryside. And I still believe this is probably one of the most underestimated aspect. Jakob's actually paper refers to it when he mentioned the hukou system, which is kind of the basis of this divide between um, elites and the countryside. But uh, I, I think it still should be said. And then last point uh, to what Mr. Wiedekoper was saying. I recently drafted uh, something on artif artificial intelligence in China. And I think the leadership really believes that they can leapfrog the West. So they invest a lot of money, for example, in research and development and leapfrogging means they are like a frog a little bit behind the rest still in some areas. And they believe that if they manage to make a big discovery, a big progress on a certain issue, because AI, let's be frank, it's a very broad church, but if they manage to make progress like also military technology, allowing them, you know, to, to overtake the rest, to, it's a frog, you know, <laughs> flying above the other frogs and then landing in first place. I think this shouldn't be underestimated as an approach, I think, at least in the mind of the big leader, Xi Jinping. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ulrich. And uh, I can't, uh, as someone who works on the different areas, security and defense, not notice how this topic of the the leaping of China in terms of technology has become the cross-cutting issue uh, that links, you know, trade, economics, security, defense globally, and we're in this area era of geotechnological competition. Um, a rich conversation so far, and what I'd like to do at the moment is is go back to Jakob for a second to see if he has any reactions to the comments that were made so far, but also to add one. One question that we've gotten that specifically addressed to him, which is our, by my colleague, uh, Matthew Perry, who also works on China and trade. And he's asking Jakob, if he could please say something about China's total tax revenue, uh, central and local government combined as a share of GDP in comparison to the EU, the US, and maybe also India. I don't know if this is the kind of data you have from the top of your head, but if you'd like to add that to the mix and come back on any of the responses you'd like to pick up on, and then I'll open the floor for a more uh, conversation with the audience. Sure. Well, thank you, Leon. No, I mean, on, on the on the question of, of general government revenue, uh, I think the first thing uh, to recognize is that, you know, we think of China as obviously, in principle, a communist country, massive government sector, 
But actually, if you look at just tax revenue, right, it's only about 20% of GDP uh, overall as a share of, of the total economy, uh, which includes, by the way, uh, profit transfers from SOEs, et cetera. Uh, that is a very low share compared to uh, certainly the EU. It's about half of the level of the EU. It's also lower than the United States uh, by a significant margin. Um, and then uh, there's also this aspect uh, that the, the revenues are very unevenly distributed, as I think I had a chart in there. There's a lot more in the paper about this, uh, that basically part of the structural problems in China is that local governments, as the, the central government uh, repeatedly over the last 20 years or so, tried to increase uh, social security, welfare provisions, especially in rural areas, well, all these tasks were basically given to local governments, uh, but they were not given the revenues uh, with which to pay for them. Uh, so basically being reliant on the central government uh, uh, for fiscal transfers, which of course is also a, a means of political centralized control. But it has also meant that all the local governments uh, uh, for decades have been constantly looking for additional revenues, which takes us into why is it that they, there is such an emphasis on land sales? Well, it's basically because it's probably the most important, if you like, off-budget off source of revenues for local governments in China. Land revenue, uh, land sale revenues, which of course means that there is a local government incentive to keep the overinvestment uh, in the property and, and real estate sector going. Uh, uh, and but now, as, as I as I alluded to, we're basically getting to the point where this is no longer sustainable. Uh, partly because of demographics and partly because so much has been built over so many years uh, that, it, that it is no longer sustainable. But ultimately, can you address these sort of deep-rooted structural issues that China faced without a wholesale reform of China's uh, fiscal revenue framework and, and central local government distribution? I would say no. And I would also say that I don't think you can get out of any of this without a significant increase in tax revenue in China, simply as a function of having to pay for an aging population. Uh, so, but, but again, uh, there has been no political willingness to do so uh, uh, to date, which is one of the problems uh, associated with, with, with uh, why China is in this dire, what has this dire outlook, uh, in my opinion, as it does. Um, just, just, I mean, I completely agree with Alicia that, you know, at, at China that grows at 2%, given the size that we are, it already is, is still going to be an important uh, a player in the world. I just think that, you know, it's important to recognize it's not going to take over the world, so to speak. Uh, it's not going to be 50% of global growth going forward, or at least hopefully not, because then global growth will be very low. Uh, and it's certainly going to have key capabilities. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, but I think one of the other things that, that we need to recognize is that one of the things we've grown accustomed to is that whatever happened, China's growth rate was stable. You know, the GDP numbers were never revised. And they were always stable. Uh, but the reality is that obviously they were not uh, uh, truthfully so. Uh, and a China that grows at 2% uh, is going to have a much more variable and much more up and down GDP growth. Uh, and it's going to be much, much more difficult for the Chinese government, quite frankly, to fake or smooth these numbers. Uh, uh, and this will put the broader macroeconomic framework in China for stability purposes under great strain uh, also. Uh, and then perhaps lastly, also to say that 2% structural long-term growth rate is a long-term average. Uh, the longer the current target of 5% is maintained, or 5.5% in fact this year is maintained, the more likely it is that China goes into a, if you like, Japanese scenario where you have a lost decade of entirely zero growth in China, with, I think it's fair to say, unpredictable uh, political consequences uh, for both Xi Jinping and the broader political stability uh, 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 in China. And, and actually, let me, let, me stop, let me stop there and hopefully we'll get some more questions.
Thank you, Jakub. And indeed, the, the questions are coming in. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with the first set. Uh, some are specifically addressed to some of the panelists and some others are not. But uh, I will take the, the, the prerogative and start with one of my own to Mr. Butikofer, uh, who, is, uh, who has agreed to respond to questions, because I'm interested in, in hearing uh, from the perspective of, 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 of his uh, chairmanship position, but also substitute member of INTA, which is currently working uh, on a number of files related to trade with China, explicitly or implicitly, such as the distorted foreign subsidies, regulation to national procurement instrument, anti-coercion instrument. Uh, I would like to hear, you know, Mr. Butikofer, what is your biggest fears with regard to China and what are your bigger uh, hopes? I mean, do you, do you, what do you, what are your concerns about a China that grows slower than it is and of which demographics are what they are described to be? Um, what are your concerns about the various topics that have been mentioned, the impact of COVID and Ukraine on how China is behaving internationally, the link between politics and, and economic policy after the party Congress? So if you would like, please keep that in mind uh, and I'll read out some more questions and then I'll start with you and then go to the to the other speakers. Uh, so there are two questions uh, from uh, Zhang Zhang, who I believe is at the University of Sheffield. Um, one is, isn't the highly centralized fiscal system helpful for mitigating the regional income inequality? Uh, so I suppose Jakub, uh, Jiu, uh, and, um, and, and and Alicia would, would, would like to come on this and perhaps Ulrich. <laughs> and then a second question from the same, um, from the same uh, person. Is the huge trade surplus a weakness and st or strength of the Chinese economy or both? So, you know, an evaluation of the trade uh, surplus. Uh, and then there's two specific questions uh, for um, you, Jim. Uh, one of them is again by Matthew Perry. Uh, you mentioned food and other inflation eventually hitting China. Do you think China's leadership failed to anticipate this consequence of support for Russia? And one more by Kjell van Beringen, who works in strategic foresight at EPRS. Do you believe that slowed down economic growth in China will lead to a reduction or increase in Chinese foreign investment in building infrastructure and buying technologies? And uh, he explains that in detail. On the one hand, shrinking returns in China may push it to look for more profitable investment destinations abroad including in developing countries. On the other hand, Chinese financial problems related to its slowing growth may reduce the funds available to make such foreign investments. And I'm sure that um, Alicia and Jakub and Ulrich uh, will also want to come in on this one. So let's leave it at this for a first round and I'll come back with a second because the questions are still coming in. So let's start with Reinhard Butikofer and then we follow the order of the speakers. Thank you, Elena, for your question. From my angle, the uh, most concern goes towards the question of whether we around Europe will find a way of dealing with the dependencies that we have allowed to develop vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. We just uh, had this striking experience with our fossil dependency on the Russian regime, which is creating lots of problems for ourselves, but uh, the dependencies that we have allowed to thrive vis-a-vis -vis China are much more broad-based and much more um, difficult to, uh, to deal with. Um, Alethea mentioned this, um, this centralization of processing capacity uh, for important industrial raw materials. Um, lithium could be added to the list that she mentioned. Rare earth could be added to the list that she mentioned. And if we allow a tech dependency to be installed and cemented, uh, I think that would be a major, a major uh, challenge to the viability of our own industrial uh, future. Uh, but, of course, on the other hand, still, most of the European companies that are invested in China make a lot of money. According to the reporting of the EU CCC last year, 77% of all European investors earned more than they ever did before. 
And uh, I recall people from the European business community in, in China always reiterating this one argument. You cannot avoid being in China if you want to be a global player. So on one hand, you have to be there and you cannot turn around on a heel. But on the other hand, if you allow the dependencies to grow, um, you might experience a fate that that could echo what we've seen in the rail industry, where first uh, Alstom and Bombardier built the Chinese um, rail industry, and then they were cast out and they, they don't win a single tender. Uh, or you look at uh, the role of uh, um, Nokia and Ericsson 20 years ago, they controlled the Chinese market. Today, they're in the low single digits uh, as regards their, their market share. Uh, and I would assume that possibly the automotive industry might be the next arena for such a turnaround. The, uh, according to numbers that I've seen, I think published by Merix, uh, the, um, there's a, a, um, a trend that European exports to China are waning in the automotive sector and Chinese uh, exports to Europe are growing. And uh, everybody expects a, a major uh, export offensive uh, from the Chinese side based on their dominance in the e-mobility sector. So I don't think it's casting stone that Europe will continue to be a major, a dominating uh, um, automotive player in, in, in the future. And how can we match this, this uh, riddle, solve this riddle of not being able to afford to leave China, but while you stay, being in danger of getting bogged down and chewed out and spit out once you're not useful anymore. And this turnaround, I think, has not really been conceptualized. And uh, industrial leaders, I think they, they know this problem, they think about this problem, but they don't talk about the problem and political leaders neither. And I think we need to have to develop a strategy to deal with that complex challenge. And I don't see that. So this is what, uh, what bothers me the most. Thank you for that. Um, and indeed food for future thought and for everyone to work on. So I'll turn to Alicia now. Uh, comments. I, I saw you nodding to Mr. Butikover's point. So maybe you want to, to add your thoughts, your reflections on his point, but I also, uh, imagine you'd like to come in on both the, the trade surplus question, but also the investments, uh, which way they will go depending on China's growth. Um, well, I mean, I, I think uh, Mr. Butikofer uh, summarized what, um, my point on really, you know, growth not being the key variable. Of course, it, it, it is important, but not enough to just say, okay, you know, uh, China will be stagnant uh, power. I, I, and, and I think that I, I, don't, I, I, I don't want to add more on that because I think he, he made the point uh, very, very clearly. Um, now, the other aspect beyond uh, control of critical technology and leveraging on climate and other um, public goods is really about China's role. And this brings me to Ukraine, which was one of the questions um, uh, globally. I mean, basically China's a role in the existing global order and in the potential change or overturn of the existing global order. Um, one economic aspect of it was a question raised on will China continue to uh, to finance the world? And if so, how? Um, I think it's actually related. Um, I mean, you don't need to finance the world to be a major power. The U.S. is a very good example, actually, uh, for China to eventually hold um, an international currency, 
what China needs to do is to borrow, not to lend. Uh, and and I think China might end up doing there, uh, doing that over time. Not yet, because China savings are humongous. But as, when we look at the data on uh, China's lending overseas, uh, and uh, and in particular in BRI, Belt and Road Initiative countries, it's plummeted, both in terms of foreign direct investment and also project finance. And 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 I think the reason out of the two that the question uh, offered is the second. China needs its own uh, savings. Um, of course, part of those savings, in a way, excess savings are um, intermediated into ex ex excess exports. The question is, there was a question, is this trade surplus a bad thing? I don't think China sees it as a bad thing, to be frank. Um, on the contrary, it's a... It's, uh, uh, extra uh, funding to, and this answers that, that question, just to buy what is really needed to move up the ladder, not necessarily to fund infrastructure as it used to be the case. In fact, uh, we wrote a, um, a blog for Bruegel um, in redefining, at least in our understanding, the Belt and Road Initiative into 2.0, and that is all about hard power. Uh, basic economic blocks and hard power. No longer I finance infrastructure anywhere because I think China has learned the hard way and Sri Lanka is just one of the very many examples. We have Lao PDR uh, and, and many others coming and possibly even Pakistan, a huge, that's the second largest recipient of Chinese funding in, in the BRI geography. So to make a long story short, I think China is thinking, I, I need to put less to get more in terms of uh, changing the global order. And that means more security. And that means whoever is with me is really with me. This is BRICS expansion. That's what we are now. No longer 148 countries, which is, you know, impossible to control. So, so uh, to make a long story short, I think we now need to focus on how is China thinking of changing the global order? What's the model? And then, uh, uh, think about the consequences for Europe. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I think on that also important to think how it's going to use its relationship with Russia to change the global order, yes. which I think is on all of our yes. minds. Um, I was meaning to add that, but it was too long. So maybe next time. <laughs> yeah. uh, but very interesting though. And and I have to point out that there's a chat going on quite vigorously about, uh, about various topics. So I encourage everyone to look at it. And one thing that Jakob responded is that the US doesn't have this massive infrastructure financing project, but it does have, you know, does supply the world with liquidity uh, by providing dollars and, 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 and that's, and by the way, there is also the build back better world G7 initiative and the global gateway coming up. So there's a few things happening, uh, but, um, uh, but minimal, but then I will turn now to. Um, UJ for her comments on the similar topics and two questions that were specifically addressed to you uh, that I read out. Okay, thank you, Elena. Um, two, um, three actually very good questions I'm trying to answer in here. Um, now, firstly, on this um, financing um, infrastructure, I think we've already seen a gradual decline in terms of China, China providing financing on the hard physical infrastructures. I think that really dated back to April 2019 on the second BRI forum, I mean, what I've noticed that is not a single fresh state capital being pledged in the time when Xi Jinping made a speech. So I think that was a clear sign. Now, further, if really concurred my thought is the time when there was a China Africa forum back to um, December, November, December last year, that for the first time, actually, China's loans and, and financing towards African countries is seeing gradual decline and not really an increase. So I think this is very much in line with what we have debated last year, whether China would turn into a turkey, turn into a self-sufficient economy, and therefore redistribute its financial resources back home, and most notably um, stay on enterprises. I think that's one layer. But the second layer is also because how profitable it would be for the Chinese companies these days to invest in Europe. And I think both for economic reasons, but also most importantly for the political reasons, the hurdles the Chinese companies will have to overcome to invest in, in Europe. And perhaps we see less Chinese activities in Europe these days. So I think both for both SOE's reason, but also for other investment reasons, you see far less China invested in up further 
But on the other hand, it doesn't mean that China does not invest in somewhere else. The key investment plays, the key focal points in here is on Southeast Asia and South Asia around China's neighborhood. Essentially, that is where the geopolitical competition will come into. So you will notice that most of the investment these days related to the BRI and all through the Global Development Initiative, the new initiative is being moving forward to, are mostly concentrated in Southeast Asia, Pacific Island, and South Asia. So that's what China is after, become very choosy. It's no longer just about spreading money all over the places, but become very choosy for what it is. Now, regarding the leadership failure to anticipate the consequences or anything, I mean, that how can I tell? I mean, who am I to tell? I can't really read the mindset of the Chinese leaders anyway. But what I can see is that the choice that China has been made it is largely ideological and also it from the terms of through the lenses of security. It is not through the lenses of economics at all. So through the lenses of ideology and security, essentially, China is looking to a neighbor that is ideologically drifting apart from United States. And China is looking for a neighbor that is not posed as a security threat towards China itself. So I think that's the reason China has made that choice on this Russian invasion towards Ukraine. It's less so about an economic front at all. Now, on the last question on central vis-a-vis -vis the provinces, and I think at the end of the day, we shall all remember, even though it is a one party rule, even though it is uh, um, governed by Xi Jinping, no matter how powerful he it is, he still have to count on those provincial governors to produce the economic record for him to justify the party legitimacy. So it's still very much, even if you have a central government giving the order, but whether those provinces would be interesting for the order, and that is a whole completely different matters. So I think, yes, we do have the central control. But on the other hand, most of the activities have still been to be counted on on the provincial government. Thank you very much also for the, the clarifications of the investment um, motivation and uh, geolocalization. Um, I'm moving to Ulrich now, and I'm aware that uh, we only have about 10 minutes to wrap up. So uh, I do want to have Ulrich come in on the questions and then um, Go back to Jakub, uh, and also one final important question that I'm saving for last. So Ulrich, uh, if you can Thanks. pick up on it. On the trade surplus, I would say that <laughs> the euro era crisis has shown that a country with, with, with a very huge trade surplus might end up by investing uh, in dubious uh, assets. So uh, there's a risk, especially you know, if you go abroad, let's say from China, you're not very experienced as they were 20 years ago. And you invest abroad, like actually I think partially BRI is going to show, you end up with considerable risk with which you might have underestimated. So there's no, from that point of view, necessarily a good point uh, only to a huge trade surplus. Uh, this also applies, and Jakob makes the point interesting in the paper, that probably the risk of other parties freezing your foreign exchange reserves, I think is pro probably very high now, also the Chinese mind. So the, there should be a tendency, as Jakob puts it in the, in the paper, to rely more on consumption and to rely less on surpluses, which probably might explain what also Mr. Bidikov and Udia were both implying, that now probably trade is more becoming a political weapon than a purely economic and financial one. I think there's agreement, if I understand correctly. Then uh, a partial answer to the problems brought up by Mr. Butikofer. I think we should more frequently look at what the Japanese are doing. They're very close by. They understand, on average, China much better than we do. There's a very kind of strange relationship going on between those two countries. But what they have been doing for a certain time now is that um, they have pushed Japanese companies who were more in the assembly sector to move to Southeast Asia. And there is also this geopolitical aspect to it brought up by Bividia. So they might leave anyway because of the changing cost advantages. But the other point is that you encourage them to leave perhaps earlier, also for geopolitical reasons, to have them go, let's say, to Vietnam or Indonesia. And the other point of this sector is that Japanese really been trying in industries where the Japanese still have a technological edge to get them out of China. I can't judge how successful that has been, but they have really pushed hardly for that. And I think the idea is such as 
good because we all know that there is some call it IPR theft going on, still ongoing areas where European or Western companies have an advantage. In all other sectors, I would still agree that, yeah, the issue brought up by Mr. Bitikova is very difficult for me to resolve in the short term. Thank you. Thanks, Ulrich. Uh, Jakub, would you like to come in on any of the questions? I think you have responded to some in the chat, but uh, would you like to come in on any of the questions that were asked in this round? No, I mean, just, just quickly on the on the trade surplus, uh, rising Chinese sur trade surpluses, which, you know, as, as the, num the most recent numbers uh, we've seen uh, from the second quarter shows a significant and, uh, you know, a dramatically the rising trend, in fact, and I think this is absolutely not uh, in China's uh, either short, medium, or long-term economic or political interests, uh, because China is already, uh, you know, it, it leads to appreciation pressure on the renminbi, and China uh, is already has the problem that, uh, you know, it has this uh, partial peg with the dollar, uh, but obviously the Fed is very aggressively raising interest rates. The problem for China is that China needs lower domestic interest rates to stimulate the economy and try to sort of caution the slowdown uh, in the construction sector. Uh, Ulrich already mentioned that it is geopolitically dangerous for China, in my opinion, to continue to uh, accumulate net foreign assets or foreign exchange reserves when all of the freely traded reserve currencies join the sanctions and freezing of such reserves in the case of Russia. And then finally, you know, a China that has massive trade surpluses with most countries is not uh, a country that has particularly more political leverage and, and much appeal to the rest uh, of, of the world. Uh, you know, one of the great benefits of, of, China, of American economic um, diplomacy was always that pretty much they could offer any partner a trade surplus with the United States. Obviously, China will increasingly not be in that situation. And then finally, and I think Alicia already mentioned it, uh, you know, we're going to have a very, very interesting development in the next six to 12 months, starting with, uh, I think Alicia mentioned Sri Lanka. What is China going to do uh, as not just Sri Lanka, but a very significant number of emerging market countries, which China has lent a lot of money to? are going to require a restructuring of those loans. Uh, you know, China is not a member of the Paris Club. Uh, it has not participated in previous rounds of IMF debt restructurings, et cetera. Uh, but China is often by far the largest creditor to many of these countries. We simply don't know how China will act, but I would contend that that is, is uh, you know, partly related to trade surpluses, but certainly increasingly a source of weakness for China rather than economic strength and political influence around the world. Thank you. And uh, and with major implications for other actors in the world, should those Sri Lanka crises proliferate. Um, we're almost done with our time, but I saved one question, which is diverges a bit from the others, but I think it's very relevant for your last, last comments for at one minute each or less. And the question is about social mobility. Uh, it's a question uh, by Tatiana, Ta Tatiana Lubicic, and she writes, when it comes to education, there has been a number of changes in China. Universities transforming into vocational colleges. Gaokao, which I understand is the national uh, university, um, seems to be now more difficult in provinces than urban centers, the national university exam, if I understand correctly. Educational and training centers have been gutted. What is the long game here? What happens when one of the few existing paths to upward social mobility disappears? And may I broaden that to say, how does social mobility uh, play into that game of, of growth? And we have very little time, but I'll go with one round. Or rather, whoever wants to come in on this, I'll ask you, and, and I'd be happy to finish with comments on this all-important topic. So um, maybe I'll go in reverse order. You, Ulrich, do you want to come in shortly on this, or should I...? Pass on to the next speaker. No, on the education, I think it's a very interesting topic because it's again a core issue uh, on many things. I'm not sure that it was meant, you know, the Gaokao to to or the different uh, rates of admission for, for different provinces to discriminate against poor provinces. I had the impression that actually the cracking down on these uh, extra scholar uh, activities was meant 
to reduce the advantage that the urban elite would have in uh, getting good results at the Gaokao. So the opposite interpretation might be right. Thank you. Uh, you, Jeff? Sure. Um, now, I mean, 30 years ago, Deng Xiaoping made by saying letting part of the people getting rich first. And now, after 100 years of the Communist Party, I think Xi Jinping certainly need another inflection point. That is, how about letting those the forgotten that have not really been benefited from the economic reform that getting rich first. And therefore, hence, what you require is you require to start to reform from the root causes of that social um, mobility stagnation, which is essentially the Gaokao. But it's really down to the whole coal system, whether Xi Jinping would have the political willingness on his third term to change those whole coal system, therefore to enable those who live in the Western and Central provinces have much better access on the secondary education and therefore produce into get them into better university for the tertiary education and therefore have a better economic future. So it's really up to the political willingnesses to dealing with a very challenging social mobility issue. Thank you. Alicia Gertigero. Thank you. I just want to add on this Ukraine issue that I didn't cover before. Um, I mean, the understanding that China is uh, suffering greatly from its uh, um, rather neutral, but, you know, slightly pro-Russia, pro um, at least in the narrative, at least in the narrative, uh, approach um, is not the way I read it and I, I and that was one of the questions I do think China is actually benefiting from from this position so far because uh, as it comes to sanctions it's not suffering because on the China is complying with the letter of the law but at the same time is is uh, gathering the global south uh, under this mantra that uh, the, glo the global order needs to be changed for in their favor. And I think we really need to focus on, on this topic and realize what are we doing wrong, if anything, and also uh, is, this, is this important for us? I, I do think it is, but in a way we might be missing the picture of what's happening behind uh, the scenes. And, and and as a final point, this is actually good for China, not bad for China. So let's let's uh, read it that way, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jakob, uh, would you want to comment on education or a final yeah, word? Very quickly. I mean, I just basically want to underline what I think you already said, that a key to you know solving China's long-term educational challenges is really reform of the Hoku system, right? Uh, uh, because it entrenches these enormous educational differences between rural and urban areas. Uh, I mean, the latest numbers I remember seeing in, in terms of rural education in China is that, you know, the, the percentage of rural students that graduate from high school in China's rural provinces is 13%, uh, which is obviously not uh, a foundation for building a higher value-added uh, society in China. Uh, and then quickly on Ukraine, I, I mean, actually, my hope would be that if China wants to reset its Ukraine strategy, it should offer uh, assistance to help begin rebuild uh, Ukraine, uh, including, if need be, uh, Chinese workers, etc., because that is precisely a way to reset, uh, uh, you know, its largely failed policy uh, closing up to Russia. And it also puts maximum pressure, obviously, on the EU and the United States to ultimately come up with their own serious money for reconstruction of Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, Reinhard Butikoff, last word. The point that Alicia made about uh, the uh, Global South dimension of the Ukraine crisis, that would merit an extensive exchange. I think we're really failing on that front so far. As regards the social mobility issue, I think that's one of the core stability threats to the rule of the C CCP. Um, I, I read an uh, article recently that argued that the grandchildren of the pre-1949 elites are doing well, whereas the social mobility for the kids of the poor farmers is being waning. And I just want to recall that in the 
great proletarian cultural revolution, it was those people that were disappointed about lack of opportunity, about lack of social mobility, that were mobilized as radicals. So I think there's a real political challenge for the CCP there. Thank you very much. It uh, remains for me to thank you and to take away um, that EPRA should have an event uh, on um, on the global south dimension of the Ukraine crisis and bring in Indian, Brazilian, South African and other speakers. And Jakub's proposal, China should be part of the Marshall Plan for Ukraine, perhaps. Uh, but thank you very much for your insights. I give the floor back to Etienne Basso, who will close the event. Uh, thank you again uh, to the speakers and the audience for great questions from my part. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. And uh, thank you to Reinhard Bidikov and to Jakub, uh, all the panelists, the participants in Brussels and beyond. And I think up to the United States, we had audience today. Uh, Elena, to you for the effective moderation and, and Cecil behind the scene. Uh, I would like also to say that uh, feel uh, free to uh, watch the replay of this event that will be put on YouTube in a couple of uh, hours or days and to promote it online. Uh, Elena mentioned the various publications on China, the one of Jakub, but also various other publications on China-Russia relation, investment, critical materials. And I'd like also to flag that we have quite a lot of multimedia products, including new products on YouTube, uh, Chronicles, uh, that uh, Ulrich very effectively pioneered in the, last, in the last days. I said it was the last event of this academic year. The next will be the 7th of September. It will be dedicated to, sadly, uh, Ukraine, six months into the war, and we will try to make a state of play of future challenges in terms of military response, refugee flows, food security and energy security, so many issues the 7 uh, of uh, uh, September, so please note it already in your agenda. But between now and then, uh, I wish you an excellent summer, uh, good rest, and thank you again for uh, being with us in the EPRS for such events. It's always a great pleasure to have you, and uh, goodbye.